Hey everybody, welcome back to Buzzsprout Conversations. I'm here today with Jack Resider, the creator of Darknet Diaries. Jack is a former network security engineer, blogger, and now a podcast host. Darknet Diaries has been profiled in places like The Wired, The Guardian, New York Times, all with uh, outstanding reviews. Uh, last year, the show was downloaded over 28 million times across podcasting apps, and this year, uh, views on YouTube have already passed 11 million. Jack, thank you so much, and welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me here. I'm excited to have this chat. All right, so for everybody who's watching you on YouTube, uh, why do you blur your face or hide it in videos? I'm a big privacy advocate, so I'm always trying to practice more privacy and do it wherever I can, right? To, to get, you kind of have to take this sort of thing. Um, companies don't quite give it to you, so you have to make sure you're looking after yourself, right? So, you know, I, I cover a lot of content, which is hacks and <laughs> people, you know, targeting other people for just hacking into their stuff. So I want to make it harder for someone to do that. And uh, that's another reason, right, is to take a step back away from the internet. Don't put all my stuff out there. And I think it's a scary place, the internet sometimes. And if you have things out there that are too revealing about you, it makes it easy for someone to do something awful to you if they have that motivation. So yeah, it's, uh, it's that kind of buffer between my personal life and my uh, public online life. Um, have you ever had someone try to retaliate for the show or dox you or anything like that? So before I started my podcast, I was just playing around with YouTube videos and uh, someone there, you know, saw some stuff in the background and it was like a mountain or something and they figured out what mountain that was. And then from there, they were like, well, where is this filmed? And, they, you know, they got a general location and then they, it, it kind of helped, helped them find the street and pinpointed where, where, where my house was. And from there, they looked up county records and found the owner of it and my name. And then look from there, figured out where I work and then emailed me at work. Hey, I'm your biggest fan. I love your YouTube channel. It's so cool. And that really scared me. So that was like kind of an early lesson of like, wow, the Internet is a big, scary place. You don't know who out there, who's out there just trying to look at everything you do and wants to know everything about your personal life. So from there, I kind of deleted that channel and took a step back and said, I, I've got to really watch after myself when I'm posting things online and be careful about it. So I, I, I've i been lucky that I haven't really had any, you know, scary situation, but that to me was just creepy enough to say, okay, this could easily become a scary situation. And I don't want it to be easy like that. I want to have that layer of protection from now on. And that was not a very large YouTube channel, right? Maybe only a few thousand subscribers at the time. Exactly. Yeah. Just playing around. So what did Kevin Mitnick's book, uh, Ghost in the Wires, how did it inspire you to start a podcast? That's funny. Um, I mean, you get inspiration from all over the place. So it's a little bit of that. It's a lot of podcasting in general. So, I, you know, before I started the podcast, I was just a huge podcast junkie. I was listening to This American Life and Radio Lab, and, you know, the, the classics, the ones that just have you hooked and captivate you about stupid things like suitcases or feathers or something, things you don't, just don't care about. And you're like, how, does, how is this so interesting? And I'm sitting in the car listening to a story about suitcases that I would never think that I'd care about. And I was really you know, interested in that. Like they hacked my brain somehow to get me into the story. And then I you know, listened to the audiobook Ghost in the Wires by Kevin Mitnick. And this guy, he's been arrested for... Um, hacking into things and social engineering places and all this kind of stuff. And it was just such an interesting tale. He's just a master storyteller, and it was in the it was in the space that I was, you know, professional in this network security hacking, this sort of stuff. This is what I spent ten years doing, going to the hacking conferences and this sort of thing. So I was like, this is such a good story. I want a podcast of just tons of this, th these kind of stories, um, social engineers hacking into places, criminals doing things from jail, right? Like it's, it's insane the, the level of stuff that went on in, in his book. And that's kind of what I, I merged those two worlds of I want more storytelling like this, because this is high drama, this is exciting, there should be this out there. 
but I also want it in the vein of This American Life or Radiolab and, and let's mash them together. And that, that didn't exist. I could not find that podcast. So I was like, oh, crap. Is this something I have to make myself? <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't quite excited to do it. And I honestly mulled over the idea for like a good nine months to a year before finally saying, okay, fine. I'm tired of waiting for someone else to do this. Uh, I'm going to jump on and, and make a podcast and started reading the book. Uh, Out on the Wire was the book that I read to get started learning how to podcast. I love that you say that you listen to the audiobook. I listen to the audiobook of Ghost in the Wires as well. I think there's a big overlap between people who really get into podcasting and get into audio uh, because it's just wonderful. They kind of fit the same uh, niche in our lives. Yeah, it, it, this kind of reminds me of something that Malcolm Gladwell said the other day. He's a famous author and he was, you know, living in New York in the 80s or 90s. And what he was seeing is people reading the newspaper. So he's like, if I'm going to be special, I got to get in on newspapers. So he started writing newspaper articles, but then he started seeing people on the subway reading magazines so he's like if i'm going to be someone special i gotta become a magazine writer right so he's getting into what i think it was the new yorker that he became a writer for and he was he was happy for that because he thought he was important because the people on the subways were reading the magazines that he was writing and then he started seeing people reading books on the subway so he's like if i'm going to be important i better start writing books so he starts writing books But now Malcolm Gladwell has this huge podcast company. And the reason for that is because when he gets on the train now, he sees people with headphones in. And he's like, if I'm going to be important, the books and the magazines aren't important to these people anymore. Whatever is in their ears is what's important to them. And so he started a podcast because that's, again, that's his still his train of thought of, I got to get in their ears if I'm going to be important. And uh, I think I might be paraphrasing the way he, he described it, but that was really profound to me of, Yes, the people today, they, they want to listen, whether it's audiobooks or podcasts or music, it's just listening has just become like our mainstream way of consuming all of our, all of our stuff. I've heard people describe it, AirPods is the first AR device that mass people use. You know, it actually augments our reality. We're walking around, our visuals are the same, but we are in a different space, at least in our minds, because we're listening to a story that's transporting us somewhere else. It's surprising, you know, you can listen to podcasts for years and eventually you feel like you know the person, you start identifying their speech patterns. You know, if you ever meet them in real life, like we're meeting now, you start to feel like, oh, I kind of know how this person talks and you feel much more familiar. Yeah, you really do get a, get a sense of, of that. But I think taking it a step further as kind of my storytelling craft is I really want you to live vicariously in the story. I don't want, like, if there's a hacker that's doing something, I don't want you to kind of step back and be like, well, I would never do that. That guy's an idiot. I want you to feel like, I want to convince you why this is a good idea this person is doing this so that you're on board, you're cheering for them, you're you're excited for them. And not in and, and, and any other world, you'd be like, that's an awful idea. Don't ever hack the police or whatever. But now you just, you're so convinced, you're wrapped up in the swing of things. And you're just like, ah, yes, do it. This is the best idea ever. And then when everything goes wrong, you can actually take that back, step back into your own reality and be like, oh, I'm so glad this was kind of like a dream and not actually me being part of this. And this, this kind of feeling of, of being part of the story and cheering them on or, or understanding the importance of it, but then also realizing like, okay, no, I'm not I'm not in trouble for, for any of this stuff that happened here. There's something special about that. There's a good feeling you get out of that, which is like you walk away just feeling like, whew, what a crazy, what a crazy feeling I just had. One that's, you know, the definition of what great fiction does is it helps us understand the motivations behind something that's totally different than the world we would live in. I remember there were, you had some people that you interviewed for one of your episodes who later on came back and said, you know, you actually really did a good job of expressing how I felt and what I was going through versus, you know, for a lot of these people that you're interviewing, uh, they're mostly, they've cr- done something criminal. They've been involved in some kind of cyber attack. Uh, a lot of them have already done jail time or been sentenced and you do a good job of empathizing with the subjects. How do you balance empathizing with what they did, but also not glamorizing it for the audience? So, I mean, to begin with, I think picking the story helps a lot, right? So as people come to me and they're like, Hey, I'm the guy who hacked blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, do you mind if I see your police report? Like, that's my first reply, right? Do you have an indictment? Do you have a, a story, like a news article about you? 
Um, and, and this helps because this, this is the whole story arc. The, yeah, this person did some awful stuff. They did a lot of things that got them in trouble. And, but, and then they got caught for it, right? So that consequence is a big deal for not glamorizing it. If I had, if I had just talked about people who got away with you know, stealing millions of dollars or whatever, that certainly would glamorize it. But the people who steal millions of dollars but then go to prison for five years, well, now, y- y- yeah, you're excited for them. You, you liked it that they got it, but then you're also like, okay, this is a bad idea. I should have realized that from the beginning of this story. How did I get wrapped up in this myself? And so that's kind of, that helps to not glamorize it. You know, everyone who reaches out to me, they're like, I want to be a hacker. I'm like, or, you know, a criminal hacker. You realize that, you know, this all always ends bad. You can't get away with it. So, um, (laughs) and I can point to my show about, you know, here's where everyone has gone wrong. I've heard you make this distinction. Can you make it for us between the word hacker and often you'll use the word attacker or criminal in your episodes? Why do you make that distinction? Yeah, I think I think hacker is just more a bigger, broader term of um, you you run into something, you you hit a, a speed bump, something that the technology is not wanting you to do, and you figure out a way around it. I mean, look at just like parent hacks or daily hack or whatever, you know, like travel hacks. Life hacker. That's what I was thinking. These are all hacks because, you know, travel hacks, the airline doesn't really want you to know this, but you have a figured out a way to go around their whole system to get a cheaper ticket or, or, or hotel room or something. And so this is kind of the broader term I think of for hacker. It's when you, you get something done that isn't and actually intended to do it that way, or maybe you got stuck and you wanted a way around it. And so I, I don't want to think that hacker is a bad term when we, people... People use it as parent hacks. Like, there are they hackers? Yes, absolutely, I agree. So when whenever I'm talking about hacker, I do try to not really use that word. Instead, use the term criminal or sc- scammer or bully or harasser, anything else other than that word to make it more specific and not not really make a bad name for the word hacker. Because I think I think a lot of us are hackers and it it should be you know praised and not so much <laughs> demonized or whatever and and so I, I do consciously try to to write with those kind of things in mind yeah it's not the tinkering or the use of a computer or trying to understand how the system works so that you can cobble pieces together it's none of that that's illegal the illegal piece is you stole someone's credentials and you were i just listened to the uh, Xbox underground episodes and you know it's these kids. I mean, often like teenagers breaking into huge systems and all sorts of stuff. And that's the illegal part. The illegal part wasn't the computer games. Exactly. So, so now let's just not say hacker and let's just say criminal. And that makes it more specific. And I like that better. Now, going back to when you first launched the show, I also remember you said that you nearly quit podcasting after just four episodes. Why was that? Oh my gosh. So I was telling you, I could not find that show that had this you know, combination of This American Life plus hacker stories. And so that's why I started. But then four episodes in, I found Reply All. And I was like, oh my God, Reply All is exactly this. And they're 90 episodes in, and it's a big company. And, and it's huge. It's a massive show. And they're like done by masterful storytellers. There's no way that I'll ever be able to compete with it. And, and you know what? It doesn't even, I don't even need to compete with it. I'm totally satisfied. I've got the show I've wanted. Why do I need to make it? Now there's one I could just binge. So I binged it and I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I need to make my show. I and mean, they're covering all the same topics that I wanted to cover. I had these stories all listed out and they're already done it. But when I listened to it, I was like, that's not the way I would have covered it. I, I have some extra points I would have added in there. I, I know some stuff about the story that they didn't even mention that I think are important. And so after listening to more and more, I picked up the mic again and I was like, I'm gonna keep going because while this is really cool, I think I have a different perspective on how things unfolded. And even though it is the show I wish existed, I still think that there's some value in the way I might present the same story. And I consciously tried to not cover the same stories as them. I think I might have done a two or three that were the same, but I, I, I went on because I thought that my opinion was unique enough, my storytelling was unique enough, and um, my understanding of technology was unique enough to have a, just a my own style that I think people could appreciate maybe separately or on top of Reply All. So yeah, it, it was a time where I, I felt like, oh, you know, someone else has already done my idea. I don't need to do it. And I quit. But then um, just 
thought, yeah, I think I think it's still worth doing. So you've talked a bit about style and finding, you know, the way that your show is going to be different than other shows that may even have some overlap in the subject matter. How valuable was it for you to use a voice coach in kind of finding your own style? I mean, when you start, you hear yourself and you're like, that's not how I imagine this show to sound. I wanted it to sound... <laughs> dark and and spooky like Mr. Robot or uh, Fight Club. The narrator in Fight Club is is great, where it just seems so dramatic and dark and something's going on there. I was like, okay, how do I sound like this? And I was, I was trying to lower my voice or talk slower, and I was just, I wasn't hitting it. So I asked a voice coach, well, what? Is, how do I sound like these guys? And uh, yeah, they said both, <laughs> both Mr. Robot and uh, Fight Club, those guys, the narrators in that are like extremely insomnia <laughs> like it's they're like falling asleep and i was like oh okay i'll try that so i i stayed up till like three o'clock in the morning to record i you know maybe episode two to try to uh figure out exactly this style and try to match it and it worked it would i mean it, it accomplished what i was trying but it was a lot of work to to do that right so i was like okay who else out there right so i was I was like, oh, Rod Sterling from Twilight Zone. I love the the dramatic narration that he does. Other sh- I really liked, uh, you know, growing up, I'd listen to um, Paul Harvey, uh, the, the rest of the story. I was like, this guy's got a great way of drawing you in. What's the writing style here? How's the techniques working? So the book Out on the Wire was a great place to start because this is Ira Glass, Roman Mars, Jad Abumrad talking about how they're writing stories. And so these were also huge influences to me. So I was like, how does Ira Glass write stories? And how does he narrate this way of speaking that I tried to mimic exactly the same way and, you know, in some episodes? And then the editing and the sound design, like I'd be very careful to listen to all this as closely as I could. I'd be rewinding and going back like, okay, they they put a song in here right before they stop talking and you know it went for like two seconds before the next person started talking like i was really scrutinizing like all the little bits in here but also playing around with like okay i'm trying to like bridge two ideas together with my voice what if i just take my voice out altogether does that does that bridge even need to be there and just leave that gap in as if i accidentally deleted my own section and that worked sometimes too so i was just really experimental playing around with a lot of different voices and styles like you know when i got to (laughs) try to do radio lab i was really chaotic with just like transitions and jumping in when i didn't need to and having the other person talk behind me and it was just like it was wild and it was very difficult. Like all this stuff was like a ton of work to really try hard to write like them, to sound design like them, to sound like them with them speaking. I tried on lots of different voices. Um, even Malcolm Gladwell, another big influence to mine, he kind of puts you in this direction and sends you in this idea where you think you know where the story's gonna go, but then he just twists it up on you and he gives you this big profound thought to like just think through for a second. And it was special to me because I remember when he makes these big points, it's almost like a philosopher point to just be like, wow, I, I never thought about football in that way or something. Let me just think about this for a second. Give me a moment, Malcolm. And he does. He's, I've heard him sometimes just put like 10 seconds of song in there just to let you think for 10 seconds. And I'm like, what? There's no other podcast on the planet that just has 10 seconds of music in between, I don't know, phrases or, or you know, pieces of the show. Like, I, you know, sometimes there's just kind of buffer music between like the intro and the guest or something. But this was just like, just give me a moment to think. And he did. And I was like, how? That's incredible. Like one time I think I even heard 30 seconds of, of music just to just to really let you absorb the thought. And I was like, OK, so I've got to build up to this kind of crescendo thought, this big point that I'm trying to make. And then just kind of leave it there and let music just simmer with you for a moment. And people pointed that out. They're like, I'm so glad that you let me think through some of these ideas and these episodes that you're going through. You're not just like rat, like hitting me fast and hard with all this stuff, but you're, you're giving me the space to absorb it. And there's something special about that. I was like, yeah. So, so this is kind of where I ended up, right? I was taking a little bit of Malcolm Gladwell, taking a little bit of Ira Glass, taking a little bit of Rod Serling, taking a little bit of Rami Malek from Mr. Robot, trying on all these different voices and doing all this stuff ended up with me kind of picking my favorite parts. I think Criminal was another big influence of mine. Uh, Phoebe Judge, right? She's just a phenomenal also at the way she narrates and, and, and does her podcast. And yeah, just taking all these bits together, 
putting it into my own kind of like even when you try to to, to emulate someone perfectly down to the every last word or nuance of their voice you're still not going to do it you still have your like your interpretation of how they sound is already different than how they really sound and then you trying to mimic that is not going to be close so you you might be 95 90 percent close just to listen to what it sounds like and think oh i know what's going on but you don't hear all the other nuances going on and so yeah it just really i think it, it helped me quite a bit um you know, for the first 40 episodes or so, I was very experimental with trying on all these different voices and sound designs and writing styles and all this stuff. And right now when I turn on the mic, I don't think about what's my style or what's my voice or or even my writing style or any of that. It's just kind of the natural me at this point. But it, it took me a long time to get there and to try it on and to do it. And I, I'm so glad I did because it was it was a it was kind of a study you know when artists do studies they do like black and white studies or drawing studies or all this stuff and that brings out all this extra stuff into your art and that's kind of what it was it was a big study for me to try on all these different styles and voices and it became a little bit of me and everything one thing you do quite often is invite the audience to feel the way the subject, the person you're interviewing right then probably felt. The way I've seen it is you're doing an interview, someone tells you what was going on, they tell you about a problem or you know the moment they're arrested, the moment they're convicted or they're, being, they're in jail now, whatever it may be. And then you'll say, can you imagine how hard this was? They just went through this, here's what's going on with their family, now they're doing, this is what's going on. And you kind of pull together a few threads and it's all things that you kind of knew. And then when you, you would pull it all together into, now put yourself in their shoes. How do you think they felt right now? Which it does a really good job of setting the stage for what they're going to do later on. Because a lot of times stuff just appears to be out of the blue. Why would you fail out of school and just spend all your time trying to hack into an Xbox? That seems like such a waste of time. But then when you hear like the story all pulled together, then it start making making sense. You're kind of like, yeah, I think that's probably what I would have been doing too. Yeah, there's. I think there's a lot of reasons behind that. I remember, you know, starting out as well as I w went through every podcast conference that I could find that had recorded their talks. And I was like, who is talking about podcasting and storytelling? I want to listen to everything. So I listened to, you know, every conference talk I could possibly drum up. And there was one, I don't remember where it was from, but it was called How to Make Your Audience Levitate. And I believe one of the key takeaways there was, you know, we're human. We're human. You have human listeners and you have human guests. We're human. Connect with us on this human level. And how do we do that? We share emotions. We share spheres. We share hopes and desires and dreams and all this kind of stuff and and the more that we can talk about these kind of feelings the more you start empathizing with the character or the or the person and when you're empathizing with them our brain does some amazing stuff it it creates oxytocin and this is um this is a good chemical it makes you feel more sympathetic it makes you for more for more closer more loving, more caring, more connected. When you're in that mood, when you have those chemicals and you're feeling that, well, number one, that's amazing that you can feel those things just from listening to some words. It, it makes the story so much richer and more profound and more connected to you. You're now, you're now feeling things that you want the story to go in a certain direction and all this sort of things. And I think that's one of the tricks I do as a storyteller is how do I get you to sympathize with them even more? And, and it's not so simple as just saying, oh, you know, think about how you would feel in this situation. Because that you, we just kind of gloss over things like that. We hear that so much. And so I really have to outline some of the specifics that were going on in the life to get you to really get into that space. And yeah, it's, it's really fun to to bring you in at that level. This is kind of a totally different uh, question. How do you use Google Alerts to find shows or find stories? Wow, you, uh, you, you're you really finding some good, good questions here. I like it. I want to find stories to do, right? And so my stories are hacker stories and stuff like this. But latest news is, is never a good place for me. I'm kind of a slow news junkie. If you have, okay, well, their latest news is that someone hacked into something and it caused some big devastation. You know what? We have more questions than we have answers right now. Who did it? I don't know. Well, what, how much damage did they cause? We don't know. And uh, How'd they get in? We don't know. We don't know nothing. We just know that there's places on fire. Okay, well, that's, that's not a story. That's all you know is that something's on fire. Okay, I'm going to revisit this in three years, five years. And so how do I, and that, because then at that point, we're going to have all the answers, right? So, so how do I revisit this in three to five years? I'm not setting alerts to like, hey, look at this story again. 
um, instead I'm setting alerts to like a Google alert, you can say, hey, Google, if you see these terms out on the internet, tell me. I want to know about it. So the terms I tell Google is like, hey, if you see a hacker got sentenced, tell me that. And so this is a great Google alert because when a hacker gets sentenced, it means that they were found guilty, right? So you got to be guilty before you're sentenced. And if they're guilty, then that means they've gotten caught. And if they got caught, that means they've done something wrong. And if they did something wrong, they're a hacker. What? I want to hear that story, right? So now we have the entire story. We've, we've, we know once the begin, once the end of the story is there, which I think being sentenced is pretty much the end. Now we can go back and dissect that whole story. We have the whole thing now. We have all the answers to everything. And so I have, you know, quite a few Google alerts like that. You know, hack crazy like a. Hack plays out like a movie script, right? Or hack straight out of a movie script. Or hacker suicide. Um, you know, if somebody dies, it would be re really a, an interesting story of what's going on there. Or hacker dead. Um, strange, you know, sadly, if it bleeds, it leads is another storytelling technique. So there's not a lot of stories I have where people die. But if it, if it happens, I kind of want to see what's going on there, what happened there. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a good tool to just drum up drum up good stories. So you said one of them is a hack that was like a movie. Have any of your episodes ever been optioned to become TV shows or movies? Mm, yeah, all the time. Um, I've gotten probably a half dozen to a dozen calls from Hollywood on let's let's go. You ready to go? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, not right. Not right now. Like to me, I'm a I'm an audio junkie. And when we're talking about hacks or even computer usage, right? Just using a computer, you can do anything. You can rob a bank over a computer, you can fall in love over a computer, you can build a company on a computer, you can do anything you can think of on a computer. But on a video, <laughs> filming this, all I'm doing is sitting at a keyboard typing away. It's the most boring video you can imagine. <laughs> so I'm like, show me your vision of how this looks cool because I, 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 in the mind's eye, it looks amazing. When you're, th when you're hearing these stories and people are doing this cool stuff, it's fun, it's exciting. You imagine all this stuff happening. But that's the theater of the mind, and that's where I like to play. That's my specialty is this theater of the mind. When you put it on screen, the theater of the mind closes up quite a bit because now you don't have to imagine as much. You're seeing it. You're hearing it. What's to imagine? Everything's there in front of you. But with the podcast, there's a lot that you can imagine, and that is really – that's a place that I like playing in. So, um, I, yeah, I have a tough time hearing Hollywood show me, like, their vision of it and – if they don't have a good vision, they just want to take my show and make it a TV show. Then I'm just like, it doesn't work in my head. It doesn't track. It doesn't map. I don't see it. So show me someone who sees it and maybe we'll talk. And that's kind of where I end up. You don't want to end up in a spot where you've got one of those like uh, CSI <laughs> episodes where like three right. people are typing to like find a hacker or yeah, something. Yeah, of course Hollywood gets it wrong a lot. But then I also I think of it you just being some boring, you know, Hallmark TV after school special where it's just super dry and not dramatic or fun or exciting. And yeah, I want, I want someone with a good style to do it and make it really cool. What did Aaron Mankey from Lore teach you about podcasting? I mean, this is, one, this is one of those things when I was starting up, I was just was doing the entire landscape. How did you get big? How did you get big? How did you get big? How did you start? What was your, what are you teaching people? And so Aaron Mankey was obviously um, a big podcaster when I got started. So I was like, let's hear it. And he was giving talks at conferences and stuff. And yeah, sure. He, uh, he kind of stumbled into it and he kind of, uh, didn't even know he was making a podcast at first. He was just reading his, his fictional stories or I don't know. He, he calls them true stories, but they're, they're ghost stories. So how could a ghost story be true? So I'm, I'm, I'm already skeptical of the whole thing, but he says, he, oh, it's well-researched and stuff. Okay. But it's a ghost story. So yeah, he kind of stumbled into it and he became big. So I was like, oh yeah, how'd you do it? And it was, it was kind of all by accident. And I was like, I can't use this accident to do, to make my show big. He was influential in the way that's just like, your style of delivery is very different than everyone else as well. So I gave his style a try. Um, you know, it's this slow, mon monotone, very subtle music behind. Not, nothing, no, no dramatic music. There's music there, but it's just, it's just kind of like, invisible music it's there but it's not present at the same time so yeah i mean just taking all these influences from different people and studying them and learning learning everything i can open up their brain and suck it all out when you're reaching out to aaron you're reaching out to all these other podcasters 
uh, you were also doing a lot of almost like PR and you got profiled in the guardian something like three months after you launched the show. How did you do that? You have, you, you, you have some really good questions. This is, um, this is bringing me back to, to getting started. So before podcasting, I had just like started tons of things, right? I started a YouTube channel. I started a blog. I started all these websites. I started all these things. And I wanted to, I was very hungry to just make something on my own, be an independent startup or creator or something. I don't know. I just know I need to like be independent and put my own stuff out in the world and be my own boss kind of thing. And so with that, I was consuming a lot of podcasts about startups and getting started and, and how to market your thing and um, books as well. And so I was, I was ready on that front, on the marketing front. I was just like super primed. And like as soon as I have something to go, I'm ready to go. <laughs> but I didn't have anything to like market. Um, but then this podcast came in and, you know, a few months in, I was like, OK, I think it's good enough to start telling people. Let's go. Um, and so one of the campaigns I did is I just took a ton of emails or found emails for journalists, um, YouTubers, big, you know, big time people on Twitter and um, just anyone with influence. And I was like, hey, I made this podcast. I think it's perfect. I think you'd love it personally, but also I think you, your audience, so, you know, people who follow you would love it. And that was it. It was just kind of two lines and, and here's a link to it. And I, I emailed 100 people, like journalists and uh, newsletter writers, bloggers, everything I could think of um, that are in this space of hacking and, and technology. And out of the 100 I emailed, two did something, right? So The Guardian, I was one of the people I emailed. They wrote um, just a blurb about me and uh, some article saying this is a, p- a podcast you should check out. And to me, that was such a big win. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm in The Guardian. This is a big deal. I don't really think anything happened out of it. I think maybe a, you know, a handful of new listeners came. It wasn't as big of a deal as I wanted it to be. But I used it on my you know, website saying, look, I'm being featured here. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm being written up by a large newspaper. And, and it, it became this kind of... Um, thing where other people it it was kind of like um where people are like well how come i'm not listening to this i'm a hacker i'm i'm in this space why how does the guardian know about this podcast before i even do right so people are jumping in just because i'm saying look the guardian's written up about it or it's on my website or something and and you know people don't know when you're starting a new podcast like uh, is this is this gonna suck is this good is this worth my time and when you have this kind of thing like look here's the reviews i'm getting then they're like, oh, I, I should definitely try this, right? So I used it for my own leverage, but I don't really think being in that article did much for moving the needle. And I think that was good, right? Or the other thing I wanted to just finish up was the other person who picked up on it was uh, Ryan Brushwood from uh, Scam School and some other, I think he made some TV shows. Um, he tweeted at it. He tweeted and like, hey, I just I checked out this podcast and it's amazing and everyone should listen to it. And he had one million followers at the time. And so those two were my big wins, like two out of 100. And that's kind of was my marketing strategy for a long time is if I could have two big wins out of 100 attempts at marketing, then it's worth it. And a lot of people don't know there's that much work involved in marketing. It's like, yeah, I tried once, twice, five times. I'm five. Try a hundred times <laughs> because if two hit out of a hundred, it's going to be massive payout and worth every cent of, a second of your effort. I want to talk a lot about what you've done to market your podcast because I think you are exceptional at some of the ideas you've come up with, but you touched on something else. I hadn't prepared to ask you about this, but you talked about social points and social proof for podcasts. And one of the ones we use everywhere else is public data, public stats. You know, if you go to a YouTube video and you see there's a million views, you're like, okay, so there's probably a level of quality here. I'll give it a test. We see, uh, we see subscriber numbers. We see this on every social platform. And yet podcasts are pretty much everything's hidden. You can kind of try to figure it out by using different apps, have some things that are public. Uh, you can look at ratings or views to try to figure it out. But you've gone in a different direction. What have you done? I really love sharing stats. I don't mind at all. I'll show, I'll show you all the numbers I've got, which episodes are, you know, the most played, all this sort of thing. So yeah, I've yearly, I've been publishing um, just a roundup of what are the top episodes and what's the best, what are all the marketing tricks I've done this year and all this sort of thing. So that's been going on for the last five years. Uh, I think if you go to darknetdiaries.com slash stats, you'll see all these write-ups. And then um, I was like, this is not good enough just to publish my stats once a year. And so I've always been working on ways to get it more up to date. 
And so eventually, it took me a long time, but eventually I was able to convince a, you know, hosting providers and metrics providers and stuff, can I access your API? And then I was able to grab that data and bring it over to my website. So now I do have every um, episode on my website will show you the exact number of downloads um, up to uploaded, up, updated daily. So it's still not quite, um, year. it's better than yearly, but it's not quite all the way up to the minute. Uh, but yeah, I, I do... I do share like here's how many downloads every episode has, and and it's because you're I feel it just like you you know you go to YouTube you can see this why don't podcasts show this as well, and I wish they did and so I'm trying to, you know be the, be in that space of like hey I'm doing it why don't you yeah I think it's really valuable, uh, with, especially when something has traction so that we can all look and get an idea of what's working and what's not and who's gotten themselves on stage and they're teaching it, but I can go look and I know now the show isn't actually succeeding. They may be selling something that they know what they're doing when they really don't. But there is, I also have another part of me that says it's really wonderful to nurture something in the beginning where there's no expectation of sharing stats. And so somebody who's really grinding and learning their craft in the beginning, because in the beginning it is really slow and maybe they're only getting 20 plays per episode, but they still need maybe the freedom for a bit to keep that hidden or else, I don't know, I, I can feel it sometimes almost like shame. Like, oh, my show's not more successful. I feel shame or bad that I haven't succeeded. Yeah, I think I, I think for me, I was, I mean, w when we look at these YouTube videos and you're like, wow, a million downloads for this garbage? What is going on in the world? <laughs> and then That's you true. look at your stats and you're like, I got a hundred downloads? Why? Is, what is... And so you, I started realizing that, wait a minute, I can't compare a podcast to YouTube. Like, that's just not a thing anymore. But YouTube is just wildly successful. Podcasts just aren't even close to this space of even close to this amount of downloads. You put a podcast on YouTube, it might get that many downloads. But for just in the podcast world, they just don't. And so I was like, okay, I really need to know what are the other podcasts getting into here? And there's some hosting providers um, that were sharing some of the some of the stats and so i think i think for the most part 120 downloads per episode or 150 downloads per episode is kind of the average like 50 percent of all shows out there are getting above that and 50 percent are getting below that so if you just you know aim for 150 downloads per episode you're suddenly in the top half you know you're above average and so that you know these were some early goals of mine like okay let's let's start there can i just be above average and and Okay, so what's the next what's the next tier, right? So eighty percent of shows get less than twelve hundred downloads per episode. And okay, that's great. Now I have the next goal to reach. Try to be in the top twenty percent of all the shows. And so now I'm trying to get to, you know, twelve hundred downloads per episode. And so these numbers are just so much tinier than what you're dealing with but you on YouTube, but it was so profound to me to hear some of these hosting providers share these numbers. Um, to say, yeah, this is what we're seeing as our show, you know, the thousands of shows that we have on our platform, this is what they're getting. And so this helped me kind of recalibrate what what's realistic goals and stuff like that and not looking at what YouTube is. And and, and I, think, I think you're right that it's kind of pure and gorgeous to just jump into a show without knowing anything about it and enjoying it. Um, but... As a podcaster, I'm just so fascinated with like, how's my show doing among the others? And I, at this point, I stopped caring and I want to make more of an impact and I have more of a connection with people. And it's not so much growth. It's more of, so let's just take this audience I have and just make it more valuable to them. But yeah, for the first four years or so, it was just all focused on numbers. Like uh, constantly, four hours a day, I was checking stats. <laughs> <laughs> Dark Debt Diaries is now six years old, and you get something like two million downloads a month. How did you grow your podcast? Mm. I mean, everything's in different phases, right? So the first 10 listeners is very different than the first 1,000 listeners compared to the first 100,000 listeners, right? Yeah, there's a lot of different moves I did. I think the thing that is probably king at every stage is word of mouth. And so I kind of knew that going into it, right? So I, I knew that the more people that I get to love it, the more they're going to tell their friends and family, co-workers. I mean, people are telling me like, oh, I 
put my parents in the car and made them listen to this. They were a captive audience for an hour and a half while we drove across the, the city or whatever. And I was like, that's great. Like you, you forced people to listen to this, to expose somebody new to the show. And I, I, and, you know, I wanted more of that. Like, how do I get people to be like, you have to listen to this. So I would ask people at the end of episodes. It was never rate and review or subscribe on iTunes or whatever that people normally say. I say, listen, I want you to text someone right now. If you like this show, text someone right now and say, listen, I have a podcast recommendation I want you to have. I want you to listen to. Tell, listen and get back to me and tell me what you think of it. And so I ask people that, you know, and I say, go to work and tell a coworker. Tell a coworker that this is what you've been listening to and that you really love it. And these are the kind of call to actions that I had. Tell a friend, tell a coworker, tell a family member, tell someone else about this show. And I did, I made it very specific, right? Like text someone right now, pick up your phone and text them. You have your phone in your pocket. I know you do. <laughs> and you know, these basic things I think went a long way. If you can't text someone to tweet, put a Facebook post, something, right? And I gave them like a specific what to do. And, and I, I think these little things just really did help at uh, getting people, because now it's like, this is what this is what Jack wants me to do. I can do this, you know. He's giving me value. I'll give. I'll throw him something back. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, anytime I saw it happening on social media, I made a big deal out of it, right? So if somebody posted a story on Instagram saying I'm listening to this podcast, I'd be like repeat, you know, reposting that story and be like, look at other people are doing this. How come you're not doing this, <laughs> right? So <laughs> you want to celebrate when you do see that happening. When you see people doing the thing that you're asking celebrate it be excited about it say hell yeah let's go what this is awesome this is exactly what i wanted thank you so much and just really be there for it first time i read atomic habits i tweeted something uh james clear and then he reposted it and said how like thankful he was and so the next time i thought about atomic habits and something i'd want to tell people i made sure i tweeted it because he'd acknowledged it and said that it meant something to him and i knew it actually like got to him versus there's so many times I've tweeted at authors that I've read a book and they don't like it. They don't see it. And it kind of just disappears. And if you're on the listener side or the reader side, you're consuming the media and you do get to reconnect to the author, even if it's just a little bit, it does mean a lot. Uh, but it's funny that sometimes creators will say things like, I don't want it to seem like I'm desperate. Like I'm so excited about the first or the only rating and review I got on Apple podcasts. And I'm like, you should be thrilled and give this person all of the, you know, the love and the thanks, because this is one person who's now said, ah, I've really found this valuable. Yeah. I think the line there for me on looking desperate versus not is if they tagged me, right? So if they're tagging me, they're bringing me into the conversation. They're at, they're showing other people me and I can be there with them. Um, but if they don't tag me, I'll often see it because I, I search my show anyway on Twitter and stuff. And there's people talking about my show that aren't tagging me. And that's where I just kind of back off. And I'm like, I'm going to let you have your own conversation. I don't need to jump in on this because you didn't necessarily welcome me and you're just talking about it. And I don't need to come in and, you know, stir up different things and stuff because people are criticizing it and stuff. And I'm just like, oh, I'll, I'll watch it. I'll see what you're, what you're up to. I'll see what's going on. And I don't necessarily need to, you know, defend myself or anything and just let it go. So that, that's kind of where the line is for me. Are you talk, are you, are you bringing me into the conversation or you just want to have as like a sidebar? And I think you do look desperate if you start jumping in on every conversation that has your name or podcast. Yeah. Or arguing with the people who say the show is not for them. <laughs> I've seen that before. And I'm like, well, 99% of people aren't going to like whatever you create, but you really are going to be successful if you can find 1% of people that love it. And when somebody jumps in to try to convince somebody who's obviously not convinced, you, sh you really got to get into my thing. I'm like, yeah, that's going to have such a low success rate. And it, if anything, it makes you look like you don't understand what's valuable about your own show. But I also think that at, when I was smaller, I could engage with every single conversation that included me or people messaging me. And I think that was really helpful because talking with these listeners, getting to know what they liked and didn't like about the show, asking them what future you know co stories should I cover or whatever, was really helpful for a kind of getting a gauge in, you know, just a get gauging the understanding and the interest and where people are coming from and what they're listening for and what they take away from and all this kind of stuff was was just super helpful at the beginning and and as I'm getting bigger I can't respond to every single thing anymore and it's kind of sad so as a, if if there's any small time creators out there really enjoy this time 
that when you're small that you can actually engage with everybody who wants to engage with you and don't don't ignore it because it's it's a special time that it, it, to me you know you ask like what's the stuff that's kept you going the most and it really is those people who are fans and showing how how the show's impacted them and i didn't expect that right i never expected that i was like maybe there's some money here or maybe there's some influence or i can use this to go somewhere else or something i don't know where this show's going but i didn't expect maybe i'm going to change someone's life and they're going to be uh change careers because of me or uh, i don't know something else like that and i'm just like wow that's this is um this is giving me the wings when i was you know down and out and didn't want to do it anymore i remembered how the fans have just been so happy that it's there and yeah to be there with the fans and be part of that whole experience is just it's it's a special thing that can keep you going through the darkest times yeah that's amazing so if you're a podcast fan and you're out there and you're listening to a show and you enjoy it especially when they are smaller shows i really encourage people to listen and then to reach out to the creators and tell them hey, this is how it impacted me because on the other side, it can often be pretty lonely. You feel like you're yelling into the void and sometimes for a while it disappears and there's nothing there. Yeah, I I, I really enjoy this actually. I mean, Twitter's something that's just so magical about that exact thing, which is, I mean, just today I was scoring an episode and I was adding all this music and I was like, well, I'm, I'm adding the same artist like over and over. I, I got to reach out to this artist and just be like, hey, you're making some pretty cool stuff. I'm, I'm really digging what you're, what you're creating. And so I follow them on Twitter and I say it and, and I just leave it at that. But sometimes that sparks up all kinds of conversations and, you know, you get new listeners or fans um, I, or just friends. Um, and it's really fun to, to just, I mean, I, there's all of these creators in the world. There's a- authors and YouTubers and, and musicians and all this stuff and just showing your appreciation, all of them and connecting with them in new ways is just super fun. It's just super fun. You, you find this new f- circle of friends that hey we're all creating stuff together and it's fun it's just fun i mean a lot of times i'll I'll see artists and i like what their art is and i'll try to make it i'll try to like draw it or paint it myself and be like here i tried to do the what you did but i'm nowhere close but here you go and sometimes they love it it's like the best thing that wow we've got fan art basically right and i remember i got fan art once for my show and it was like so amazing to me that somebody had made something related to my show just their own art and i was like what so yeah it it's really fun to engage with other creators and let them know how much you appreciate it and see what comes back and you can't expect anything back but there's a lot that has come back for me and and it's something i'll I'll keep doing forever it's just like wow this is such a great podcast I, i love listening to your stuff and you send that little note and boom the world, the world can change like in a weird way where suddenly they're a guest on your show or you're a guest on theirs or whatever's happening. It, stuff happens. This reminds me of a marketing tactic you talked about once. Uh, you called it tapping on shoulders on the internet. What is that? I, I think I used it in the context of trying to find guests. And, you know, in my show, I really want those guests that aren't talking, right? So it's it's a dark, it's dark place that I'm going into. And there's a lot of people who are very confidential and have NDAs and will never talk about things, you know, like if they're a nation state hacker, like they can't talk about that. So those are the shoulders I'm going to tap on anyway. I'm going to be fearless about like, hey, I know you worked for the NSA. Are you able to talk about anything there? And no, gosh, why would you ask me? And then <laughs> let's go up to Canada. What's uh, Canada's NSA? Who are all the people there? And tap on those shoulders. No, I can't. And so I'm pushing that line, you know, it, it makes the guests hard to say yes by default. Right. It's just that if I'm getting a lot of yeses, I must not be, you know, working hard enough. So one out of 10 might even reply, much less, you know, most of them say nothing. The reply is no, I can't come on your show. But then, you know, you just make it one out of 20 and there are two out of, you know, one out of 100. Finally say, yeah, I can. And it's like, what? This is the the most exciting story I've ever had now suddenly. Right. Because 99 other people were saying, no way, it's never going to happen. And I found one that said yes. So yeah, I mean, this is kind of my tapping on shoulders of just keep going until you find the one and and make it hard by default so that everything that comes out on your show is just like, how are you getting these guests? How in the world did you find this person? You know, I wanted to ask earlier how you prepare yourself for all the notes. You know, you put out a hundred requests for someone to feature or highlight the show and you're excited to get two of them. You're 
And now you just said, if you're not getting no, if you're all yeses, then uh, you're probably not shooting high enough. You're not going for the best guests. How do you prepare yourself though to get all of those rejections? I think, you know, another way to ask this is like, how do you, how do you handle criticism or even praise? And I think I have to kind of compart, I, I, I take it, the show is separate from me and I, and I really separate it in my head. If somebody's criticizing what I said on the show, it's never me that I feel like I did something wrong or I screwed up something. It's always like the show is that, right? And so let's, I'll criticize the show too. I, I know that I use past participles incorrectly as I'm talking, right? I wish that guy knew like better English, you know? Uh, and so I could, I can easily jump on board this too, because I, I see that the show isn't, isn't the best. It's, it's got some places that it, I, it could work on, but there's just no time for it. And so I don't get to it or whatever the case is, there's, there's excuses that I have, but I can still criticize it because I, I know what's wrong with it. And so when someone does it too, I can be like, yeah, I, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you, but that's the show. That's not on me. That's not my problem. <laughs> I separate it in my head, so it never it never gets be, it never becomes personal, and I think it's the same thing with getting those no's. Right? It's not the personal rejection. It's not I'm doing something wrong. It's okay. The show is trying to hit these certain goals, and the show just needs to keep trying in order to get there. And, and it's the same with praise. If somebody says, "Oh, you make something great," okay, you're talking about the show. You're not talking about me because it, any praise that I get or criticism I get, I can't if I bring it on board personally. It's going to fluctuate my mood and it's going to mess me up for like creating. I just want to, I want to create something cool. I want to be excited about this. And if I have all these thoughts in my head about people who don't like it or, or didn't like this or whatever, and that's on me, then it messes me up with my whole flow. And so I really just take all the praise and all the criticism and put it somewhere else. I put it in the show. That's the show. That's not me. And just leave it at that because I agree with them. They, their show has some problems. It needs to be <laughs> needs to be improved as well, right? And and I, and anytime I met, meet a fan that likes it, I'm on board with them. Of like, I'm a fan too, and that's where we connect. I don't take their praise on as like, oh yeah, you're talking about me. It's like, yeah, I love that show too. We both connect over this because we're fans of that show, and they don't really understand this or know this. That that's how I'm kind of approaching praise in person or whatever, but. That's um that's the way I think it through in order to not let it get to my head and to yeah you can't you can't bring either one of them on board the praise or the criticism. What do new podcast creators think will move the needle as far as growing the show, but doesn't? I think you, you hear these people saying rate and review that's going to move the needle. Um, I don't agree with that. I've um, I've looked into this quite a bit, and I feel like um, the algorithm, the Apple podcast algorithm, does uh, doesn't include ratings and reviews it just includes mostly new new listeners new subscribers and, and number of listens per episode and that's where the algorithm kind of comes into play uh, the ratings and reviews just isn't there um, and the way i know this is because i got into the black hat world of people gaming the apple charts and it was like okay well how do you game the charts and none of them were messing around with ratings and reviews and they were able to get shows up to the top slots using um just downloads and plays and new subscribers. Yeah, episode 27, yeah. Chart Stoppers, is all about this, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or Chart Breakers. Chart Breakers. How did you figure out people were scamming Apple Podcasts? I was very focused on podcasts, like the whole podcast space. And I was like, how come these sh these shows I've never heard of are hitting the top charts? What is going on here? And, uh, and I'd be trying my best to see what the stats are, you know, looking at other apps and stuff like this. And like, the stats just aren't adding up. There's just not enough engagement on Twitter. There's not enough anything going on. There's no celebrity behind this, yet this show's number one. What is happening here? And it just didn't seem right. Then You got that little man inside you that knows something's not right about this. And if you just, you, t you let him out and you see, you hear, you hear what he has to say, it sometimes takes you places. Did you ever get Apple to talk to you about the charts, the people who are scamming the charts? Yeah. And this is um maybe another big tip of mine. Of I have a blog called lime.link. And this is a this is a blog. I just blog about podcasting. The more excited I get about some of this stuff, the more I'm sharing about like here's how to game the Apple Podcast charts or whatever. The more interesting people come out and start talking to me. People from Apple, people from YouTube, people from some of these hosting providers that I get mad at or criticize or praise or whatever. And I really encourage people to blog about 
things and expose themselves, make, make almost almost in a, in a vulnerable way of like, here's how much I hate this, or here's how much I love this, or here's where it's you know absolutely killed me or crushed me or whatever. You'll connect with people who have gone through that same experience, or you'll connect with the makers of those tools to try to rectify the problem or something, and you create all these new friendships. And so, yeah, I mean, the folks at Apple Podcasts started listening to the show after that, and they reached out, and we started collaborating on things, and I've been featured a few times <laughs> since then. And, and it's it's interesting because I was exposing their algorithm, right? And I was talking about it, but the more they got <laughs> into the show, the more they're like, well, we got we to gotta get this guy featured and stuff because they, they were just became fans. It was a weird experience. And um, I can't express how much that blog has just connected me with people in the podcasting space that have made such a difference in my life. I mean, I've met executive producers from that and um, owners of other podcast companies. And they just, I mean, the people who are really got their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the podcast world want to know all the latest articles about podcasting. And if you have something exciting to share, that sometimes gets picked up by newsletters. And then those newsletters get read by some of the big players in the space. And you make you make waves because the podcasting world is still fairly fairly small. So there's not a lot of news going on on a daily basis. Yet there's a lot of people who are reading that daily news. I think this really goes for almost any industry. If you are willing to be the first person to talk about something and kind of raise the flag, here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what's frustrating me. Here's what's interesting to me. There's a lot of people who are not willing to be the first person, but they're very interested in having that conversation. And now all of a sudden you are the oh, that's the person I should talk to about this. You know, you said that in the episode, uh, you talk about, I started tweeting about it and then other people jumped in and were like, oh, I've been following these charts too. And here's some others I found that were suspicious. Here's what I think's happening. Here's how I think the people on LinkedIn who are actually doing these scams, how they find you. And it led you down like, okay, I'll change my uh, profession to podcaster and boom, they all start reaching out to you. It's a wonderful episode, by the way, for anybody who is a podcaster, and you want to learn about some very shady uh, marketing tactics. Hopefully they no longer work, uh, but for a period they were absolutely working wonders. And it was super interesting to hear, not only did you figure out what was happening, but you talked to all the people who were actually doing the scam, or I guess kind of spammy thing, it wasn't really scam, uh, but they were getting up in the charts. It was uh, just a super interesting episode, and you got all the people there. Yeah, I see a lot of people ask on Reddit and stuff like, hey, does anyone try out these Fiverr podcast promoters? Is this worth the money and stuff? Like, this episode will answer that for you. <laughs> right? so I call them up and say, what's your strategy? <laughs> Let's hear it all. And uh, it's really fun to, to get into that. And that, I think that's also exciting, too, because that one wasn't really in my wheelhouse of like, here's hacker story, but it was something that was in kind of the podcasting space. And so a lot of podcasters resonate with that episode, which then they wanted to hear other episodes. Right. So I brought in this whole new group of people into my space because I went into their world and did a story about their world. And, you know, another another thing I'm going to be doing a story on is dubstep. And so this is gonna this is gonna bring a whole bunch of you know dubstep people into this podcast that they're gonna be like, well, this is a this is a cra this is such a crazy show. I want to hear more. So sometimes it's worth getting deep into another world, another group of people, another subject, and then try to scoop up as many of those people as you can right, to be really in their world with them. And so you know, as I'm as I'm doing this story about dubstep. I don't, I'm not a fan of dubstep, but I'm listening to tons and tons of music until I learn to love it, until I can appreciate it, until I understand the players and the actors, so that when I start that story, when I get into that episode, I can really connect with the people who love dubstep and not feel like I'm just like some dubstep hater, but really I am part of this scene as well, and I want to be, I want to share with you this crazy thing that happened, because that's where the people that are loving that sort of thing or whatever are going to appreciate about the storytelling I do is when I'm when I'm loving it with them. Because if I come off and be like, yeah, I hate dubstep, but I'm going to do a story about dubstep, then they're not going to want to listen to much more of that, right? So you really have to be passionate about the subject you're getting into. Yeah, I mean, you'll just alienate the people that you're trying to bring the story out of, and they're just going to close off or even probably not do the interview to begin with. Yeah, but it, it's it's a big commit to listen to hundreds of hours of dubstep. 
<laughs> even though you don't like it until you find until you get to a place where you love it and you appreciate it and you like the dance and the artistry and all the stuff involved with it. I saw that you took a three month break from podcasting at the beginning of this year. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it was just some, I need some personal time to do some things, but there was a, it was also a good timing because after five years of podcasting, I had felt like I made it. I had, you know, gone past all my goals and I was like, okay, I can kind of let this thing go on cruise control for a while. If it was in the first three years, I would have been really, it would have been really hard to take that break, right? But I felt like, okay, I put so much stuff out there. I have so much content. I'm just, you guys can catch up. <laughs> you guys can re, re-listen to stuff. I don't think it's going to hurt me too well. So that was kind of how I balanced it. But um, it really was good for me to kind of let me, I was kind of feeling like I was sinking and underwater and the schedule and getting everything out the door and, you know, time restraint restraints and all this and, and listening to hundreds of hours of dubstep yeah exactly <laughs> uh, so it, it gave me this kind of uh, breathing room which is, allows me to make better content too and and i think there's kind of two school two schools of thought on what kind of content should i make and like one school is just put as much out there as you can are you doing weekly okay great now look can you do daily daily episodes and all right great now can you do four a day and i'm not kidding because this sounds like uh, gary vanderchuk yeah gary vanderchuk is just like you're never doing enough right but there there are daily um radio shows that do four hour shows a day right and Mm -hmm. every single day of the week they are out there making four hour long shows and to me, that's like four episodes a day. So, so you can't really overdo it on that level. You could just be, you could, it's insane on how much content you could do. And I've seen other shows that are just like, we're 24 seven streaming. And I'm like, are you serious? So um, that's one way. And, and the, the theory that Gary Vaynerchuk is saying is like, just, just keep putting stuff out because the more stuff you have, the more options people have to consume you. But I'm on the other side of that spectrum, which is I want you to be fully caught up with my stuff. I want my show to be your prime time listening experience where you, when a new episode's coming out, you reserve it for that special time when you know you can dedicate an hour non-distracted listening, whether it's driving or walking the dog or whatever it is that you're going to do to just fully enjoy that. That's the, that's the space I want. That's the time I want with you. I don't want you to be fully caught up. And I think hardcore history does that, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of too. Yeah, they want you, they they put an episode out every three months or so. And it's like, well, when it when it's out, everyone's going to catch up like immediately and they can't wait for the next. And I don't mind when people are begging me for more. I think that's a much better place than being like, sorry, but you overwhelmed me and I, you've got too much stuff out there. I've got to, I had to stop and I, I'm like super far behind. Um, yeah, so that's, I think those are two, two good, I mean, they both work. Do either one and, and you'll probably have a great success. The Gary Vanderchuk thinking I find to be very valuable for new podcasters or new creators because in the beginning, uh, we use some type of perfectionism to kind of cover for the emotional issue we have is that like, we just feel uncomfortable putting stuff out there. So we're like, oh, we got, it's gotta be perfect. And so we delay and we delay and we plan and we prep and we save up for expensive microphones and then we we never do it and so i think in that in in those times you know gary's saying you're gonna do four episodes today and you're gonna do them all on your phone at least that takes all those excuses away but i can't think of any video or tweet or anything that gary vanderchuk did in 2010 that still has staying power now his books do but it's not like those tweets and those live videos are sticking around but hardcore history episodes from 2010 are really really good and they still have staying power no i agree with you i think e- even at the beginning when i was starting out i was like i need to just put out so much more stuff i mean reply all has 90 episodes i have four like there's there's the, like people are not going to even binge like the by the time they start the binge it's over so i was like i just need a ton of content like that i know that's what i need and 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 at the same time i knew i needed to learn the whole craft and so i did kind of know that first year was just i'm going to learn this craft and i'm going to put out as much stuff as i can and it's not going to be the best and it's not going to be my you know longest staying power or whatever but i just need to get through it and you really do need to get through uh, just cutting your teeth on on learning your craft and and you know i think I think we're all creators where, you know, if we're, if you're a podcaster, I, this is probably not the first thing you created. You're a creator just by nature, right? You've probably created other things, whether it's a blog or a YouTube video or any, even a piece of artwork. If this doesn't work for you, don't let that creator in you die. Go 
create the next thing. And whatever you learn from this whole podcasting experience is going to carry over into your next thing because that's what happened to me. All this stuff that I was creating before this came to a head in the podcast. And so I'm like, oh, now I know how this algorithm works and I know how that works and who the players are in this space and where the conferences are and all this kind of stuff. And so when I started my podcast, I, I felt like I had a really good grasp on just creating in general and and building something and all this stuff that I wouldn't have had if this was the first thing I created, right? So it was a, an accumulation of all the, all the things I've created in the past made this something special. And, and just keep that in mind on your journey of like, it might not be this, it might not be the next thing or the next thing or the next thing, but you keep going and there will be something that just explodes. We've talked a lot about the podcast, creating the content. You started in 2017, 2019, you were able to quit your job and focus full-time on the podcast. And a couple of years later, you said you're making more money from the podcast than you ever did as a network security engineer. How have you monetized the podcast? I put ads in it. So I have host, host read ads and, um, but I've also got, you know, Patreon going and I've got shirts that I'm making and, uh, those are some other streams, but the ads are the main thing. The first 40 episodes, I couldn't afford any any help, right? So it was just me just trudging through it. There wasn't money coming in. There was barely enough for ramen, if anything, right? And so it was all on me. But now I've got a team of like nine people that are helping me on. And it's because I can afford this sort of thing, right? So the, it, I think it's a good strategy that if you can afford to reinvest in your show and make it better in some way, then that's good. And you might not be making a profit out of it, but at least you're making the show better and you're you're able to keep it going. And I think there's three big challenges for podcasters. One is making a great show that people are going to like. Uh, two is marketing it, making it spread. And three is keeping it going. And that's either monetizing it or, or having that uh, drive to keep it going because you can lose out on that and then just stop because it's just not feeling worth it to you for whatever reason. And so, you know, the, the money is keeping it going in a way that works out. Um, you, I'm not reinvesting everything because then it, it doesn't feel like I'm pulling anything out of it, right? So at least I'm able to enjoy some of the benefits of it. But Enjoy some of the ramen that you make. You've done a few different things with premium content. So you were uh, highlighted by Apple Podcasts for doing an Apple Podcast subscription where people can pay for an ad-free or bonus episodes. Uh, you have a pretty robust Patreon community uh, where people get asked access to a Discord chat uh, and community with everybody else who's a patron. How have you found that to fit in with the rest of your podcast monetization? Patreon is going good. I think um, I think it, it was interesting at first. I, I wasn't going to do Patreon, but... Um... I had like, I think it was five people that asked, where can I donate to the show? How can I give to help you out? And I was like, geez, if five people are asking, I better set something up. And so I didn't even feel like holding my hand out was a good idea at first. Like, just just, just enjoy it. Let me sort out the money thing on my own. But um, yeah, I was like, you know what? If people want to help, I'll set up Patreon. And so I did. And I think um, most of the people that are on Patreon just want to support the show. They don't really want anything, any benefit out of it. Um, but I do offer some bonus episodes and the ad free feed and um and discord access and stuff like that so it, it's really working out really well which of those do you think is the biggest draw without being extra work for you because sometimes the bonus episodes can seem like you've doubled your workload and especially early on if you've only got two people who are supporting uh you can't double justify doubling the workload for just those two so how did you manage that yeah i think um I think the bonus episodes did almost break me of like, oh my gosh, now I've got to add more workload to my week. And it makes sense because I'm making the money here on Patreon, so I should just be able to hire like another producer, but it just didn't work out that way. And so I felt super guilty by not delivering. And yeah, that was a, that was probably the worst. I, I mean, they, people love it. So they, they it's nice having um, bonus content to enjoy if you're all caught up. And like I said, I want to get to that all caught up state. So here's the next option. I just couldn't make it work out in the way that I wish I could. It's kind of the opposite answer for your question, but I'm going to leave it there. Yeah, I think it's good. So last question, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to start a podcast now, just considering it and they're not sure if it's right for them? Yeah, I think a lot of people wonder if their, their um, topic is unique or special or anything like that. And I think, yes, it is. I go for it. Like, 
we're never going to we're never going to run out of news to talk about there's always new news we're never going to run out of music to talk about or sports to talk about there's always a new sports event happening and people want to talk about it and so we're 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 just creatures of wanting the new stuff and if you've got something to talk about that's new just leave it at that it doesn't your topic doesn't have to be niche it doesn't have to be special just it's new because you're you're just putting it out now and so that's enough right there to be special. That's worth doing. And I definitely say do it because it also is part of your creative journey, right? And you're trying this space out. You're trying to do this. And it's going. you're going to learn so much just stepping through, well, how do you record? And where is the editing button? And how do I upload? And all this kind of stuff. And all this, all this builds into just who you are as a character and, and how much you're willing to put into certain projects and and then you know put the creative juices together to make an interesting thing um it's it's just all part of the creative creator journey i think and you've got to be you've got to be in it doing stuff if you're going to have this journey right so spend the hours spend the time just making stuff it does i don't really care what just make it and yeah i i'm i'm a big believer on your vibe attracts your tribe so just be as genuinely you as you can and People who connect with you and pick up what you're putting down are going to be perhaps, you know, some of your closest friends at, at later on in life because they like your style. They like the way you think, the stuff you talk about. Like, that's great. Don't try to, don't try to be the thing that they want you to be. Be yourself. And that is going to attract the right people that you're going to appreciate are your friends if, and your fans but if you are trying to impress everyone and just be what they want you to be, then you're going to always struggle with not being good enough or good, whatever. And yeah, if, if, if they just connect with you because you're you, then you can always ride on that ride. And that, that, that's always fun. Yeah, you can let your guard down, just be yourself rather than having to continue the facade that you uh, started. So that if the facade is what attracted people, then you have to keep that up forever. And uh, yeah, that's not going to work. Jack, thank you so much for spending uh, way more time than I asked you for. So I really appreciate it. Uh, I know this is going to be a wonderful episode. Yeah, this was a lot of fun to get into and dive in. Thanks. Thanks.